Hi, hi everybody. Um, so uh, the title of this is, is Lower Limb Motor Sparing Block. So as you know, over the last sort of several decades, we've started to move away from uh, the dreaded opioids, uh, which we know um, have really um, uh, uh, considerable effects on delaying uh, patients' rehabilitation after operations, and are particularly ineffective for orthopedic bony pain. Um, so we've got a li little bit more um, uh, accurate, if you like, as, as time has gone on, um, using neuroaxial blocks and neuroaxial opioids. And then in the 90s, really uh, moving to heavy use of peripheral nerve blocks, but realising also that they, they were causing quite profound motor blockade of the limb and stopping patients, you know, getting out of bed after knee surgery. Um, so, you know, the surgeons really took the lead on local anaesthetic infiltration, which is highly effective, but we've realised that it really doesn't last very long. So, you know, four or six hours and then it's starting to wear off and the patients are, you know, back to square one and in pain again. So we've sort of been looking at these motor sparing blocks and what I'm going to talk to you about today is whether they work or not. Um, I'm going to talk about what I'm going to call the subsartorial block. Um, you can talk about the femoral triangle and the adductor canal, and, and both of those terms are being used to describe this anterior approach um, to the terminal branches of the femoral nerve in the thigh. Um, and as I'm going to describe to you, it can be a bit misleading, and there's a reason for that, which I will describe to you as well. But essentially, the two bits of the femoral nerve that travel down with the femoral artery in the anterior thigh are the saphenous nerve, which we know has articular supply into the knee and also the ankle, and so is important, and the nerve to vastus medialis. And this is obviously the nerve that is supplying the muscle, but it also has articular supply into the knee and it is quite important, um, uh, you know, it has quite a, a wide supply into the knee itself. And then I'm going to talk about uh, the IPAC block, which is a blockade of the uh, popliteal plexus of nerves um, at the back of the knee. So I'm just going to mention the anatomy, hopefully just to dispel a few myths, if you like. So just going back to med school just for a minute or two. So uh, the picture on the right here just demonstrates this so-called femoral triangle in the thigh. So the inguinal ligament forms the base of the triangle. And then this is the sartorius muscle here, which arises on the anterior superior spine and runs from lateral to medial down to the tibia. Um, and is a, is, a, is a very long muscle and crosses, of course, two joints, which is very unusual. Um, so the femoral triangle, uh, its borders are the medial border of sartorius and the medial border of this long adductor muscle uh, running down the thigh. So that is our femoral triangle. And the contents, of course, are the artery, femoral artery, the, the vein, and the femoral nerve lying lateral to the artery and as, you, as it travels down the thigh, leaving, as I said before, the saphenous nerve and the nerve to vastus medialis. Okay, so if we go just a little bit beyond the tip of the femoral triangle, if we go beyond that and look under sartorius, we are by definition then in the adductor canal, which is this green shaded thing here. So we've removed sartorius from this cadaver, so we can see the femoral artery, and we can see the terminal branches of the femoral nerve. And the uh, adductor canal itself is really quite short. It's about 10 centimetres long, running from the tip of the uh, femoral triangle to the, uh, that defect in adductor magnus that you remember from med school, where the, the femoral artery travels through it and becomes the popliteal artery in the popliteal fossa. So quite a short um, structure. Now, the reason it's important, and I'm harping on about it, is that the adductor canal contains the saphenous nerve, but it does not contain the nerve to vastus medialis. And this has only recently been properly understood. It, the nerve to vastus medialis leaves the adductor canal and travels in its own little uh, fa uh, fascial tunnel. So it's not part of, of, the, uh, of the adductor canal. OK, so um, just moving back to this anatomical picture, most of the sort of adductor canal blocks that I'm going to just describe to you in the papers are around this region here. So they're probably more femoral triangle than adductor canal blocks. 
But don't worry about that. I'm going to call them adductor canal blocks because the papers call them that. But just think of them as a block underneath the sartorius muscle. So we're wanting to clobber the saphenous nerve and the nerve divastus medialis. So does it matter where I perform the block? Well, as I've been alluding to, we want to catch these two nerves that are supplying quite a vast amount of sensory supply into the anterior knee. So it is important to do our, our, our block proximally in the thigh, not distally. So distal subsartorial blocks in the adductor canal, if you like, will catch the saphenous, but not the nerve to vastus medialis. So they're good for ankle surgery, but not for knee surgery. However, the Danish group are doing a bit of cadaver work and showing flow of local anaesthetic distally from the adductor canal distally into the popliteal fossa. So there may be some papers coming out in the near future showing adductor canal um, blocks being effective in blocking the pop popliteal uh, plexus. That's something they're looking at, but the, the evidence isn't actually there yet. So this group uh, looked at positioning of uh, these blocks in the thigh uh, and they used ACL repair as their, as their model, if you like. So they actually looked at three positions. So looking here on the left, there, there was a proximal block, a mid-thigh block and a kind of distal, more adductor canal level block. So if you think about it, the sartorius is going from lateral to medial. So laterally, pro proximally in picture A here, the muscle is lying on the lateral side of the artery. In the midpoint of the thigh, it lies over the artery. And in the distal part of the thigh, in the ducts canal, it's lying more on the medial side. OK, so those are the three positions. They randomised them into three groups, put a decent dose of local anaesthetic in, and they sensory and motor tested them pre-op. All of the patients had a sensory block dem demonstrable before surgery started. And what they showed is quite an impressive uh, advantage for knee surgery of the proximal block over the other two positions. So you can see about half uh, the morphine dosage was required, highly significant, um, more effective proximally than in the mid and distal positions. And that was reflected in the post-op nausea and vomiting. Um, the patients with the proximal blocks also had less pain on arrival and recovery and at six hours when compared to the distal group. So it's likely that the proximal blocks are more effective. Thankfully, uh, there is very little effect on motor power. This was pre-op, so this is before any surgery was done. Very little effect, it wasn't significant, on motor power, which is, uh, I suppose, advantageous because that's the title of my talk. The authors opined on the reason for this proximal block being more effective. Uh, one of the reasons was that they postulated was a proximal spread of local to the femoral nerve uh, with a preferential sensory block. I think this is unlikely uh, because you'd see more of a motor block if you're getting a uh, profound blockade of the femoral nerve. They opined also that the block may be spreading distally into the popliteal plexus. Again, unlikely because you'd be more likely to see flow distally with the more distal blocks than the proximal block. Uh, which leaves us with the final reason, which is probably the real reason, is that we're blocking both the saphenous nerve and the medial vastus nerves that supply quite important supply into the anterior knee. And that's the, the likely reason for its efficacy. So having shown that this block works, uh, in terms of knee arthroplasty, we have to ask ourselves, is it better than an infiltration? And is it worse than a, a full femoral nerve block that we used to do, uh, which worked for years and years, but of course causes motor blockade? So the first question, local infiltration. This is a study from Regional Anesthesia Pain Medicine, 2016. They randomised 40 knee replacements. They gave them all multimodal analgesia. They gave them all a spinal. And then they randomised them into uh, a ductor canal group decent dose of 0.25 bupivacaine or a duct, uh, a, a duct canal with saline. So they had a sham group. So quite a nicely designed study. Both the groups received infiltration with a kind of standard cocktail mixture of bupivacaine, morphine, ketorolac, clonidine, and so on. What, what did they show? Well, they showed that the active group who received the local anaesthetic uh, used less morphine, significantly less morphine, up to 36 hours post-operatively. 
and they had a lower pain burden. This was a, 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 a error under the curve type thing that they worked out the, uh, from the, the pain scores uh, postoperatively. So they showed an effect up to 36 hours postoperatively. So really, really quite an impressive um, uh, result, I think. Patients were reporting pain at about the same time postoperatively, but the pain score was significantly lower with the block group as the control group. And interestingly, if you block patients' anterior knee pain, they notice it more in the posterior knee, and that was a significant difference between the two groups. And I think more impressively, uh, patients were um, significantly more satisfied with their pain control at 24 hours postoperatively. And I think if the patient has actually noticed that there's a, a, be a benefit, then that's, uh, that's quite an impressive result. They also uh, went home or were ready for, to go home significantly earlier. So a ductus canal block is effective um, after knee replacement, and it's more effective than local, local anesthetic infiltration alone. Um, that's because it prolongs the analgesia. Now, is it more effective than a femoral nerve block? That's the next question. So this, again, used um, TKA patients, um, again, double blind and randomized into either ductus canal block, again, take that with a pinch of salt, this is subsartorial block, as I described earlier, or a femoral nerve block. So they all got a spinal, they got a pretty decent dose, much more than I would use of ropivacaine, onto either the adductor canal or femoral nerve. <clears throat> and then they got a catheter infusion for the first 24 hours into the adductor canal or the femoral nerve. What they showed was that the quadricep strength was much better in the adductor canal block, not, not surprisingly, uh, than the femoral nerve block. That was significantly different. But there was no difference in morphine consumption pain at rest or during flexion with the adductor canal block compared to the femoral nerve block. So it seems as though from this study that the adductor canal block is performing clinically as well as the femoral nerve block, but avoiding the motor block of the, of the thigh. The uh, opiate use was, uh, was not significantly different between the two groups um, uh, all the way through the study and up to seven days. So how do we do it? Um, so this is a little uh, screenshot from Paul in my book. Um, femoral triangle block uh, on the left and a ductus canal block more distally on the right. I consent patients for a block. I tell them they may have a heavy leg, although we're trying to avoid that. I've not actually been aware of one yet, although I can't say that I go and strictly test them all postoperatively. Um, and in fact, in, there's one study I saw that showed that post-op power was actually improved within the ductus canal block, probably through the superior analgesia that the patients get uh, following the block. So the leg is supine, slightly externally rotated, 50 or 80 millimetre needle, depending on the size of the leg, linear probe, occasionally curvilinear in very obese patients. And I use about 15 mils of 0.25 LV pivocaine for the block. So the block we're doing for the knees is on the left, the ductus canal is on the right. This is the typical picture you see. It's quite an easy picture to get with ultrasound. Here's the sartorius muscle. Importantly, here's the membrane under sartorius muscle that you need to identify. This is the lateral side. This is vastus medialis on the lateral side. The ductus are on the medial side. And the nerves are these little gray blobs that you can see just on the lateral side of the artery. These little gray blobs here femoral artery, femoral vein. So if we look on to the right side of the picture, now vastus medialis nerve is left, leaving us only the saphenous nerve here, just sitting on the lateral side of the artery. It's about to flip over to the medial side to become a medial structure in the calf. So what do we do? So this is one I did last month. Here's the artery, here's sartorius, sort of on the lateral side because we're quite proximal. The nerves are in here somewhere, so I'm going to aim my needle down here, um, inserting the needle through sartorius. The only thing you've got to make sure you do is not get too close to the vessels, of course. Once you're into sartorius, you need to then go to up to the membrane. You'll see a, almost the pop here. There we go. It just goes through the membrane. You can feel that pop more often than not. And then you inject your local anesthetic. This should be very low resistance. You should see it immediately. You don't want to be in the femoral vein. 
So you need to see that expansion all the way through your injection. It should be very low resistance and you can just about make out the great blobs. These are the nerves here. So really easy block to place. So subsartorial blocks uh, are add value to um, local anesthetic infiltration for knee replacement, for ACL repair. They prolong the analgesia at least into the first post-op day. What about IPAC block? Well, that's infiltration between the popliteal artery and the capsule of the posterior knee, described by Sanjay Sinha a few years ago now. Um, why? Same reason as the adductor canal block. The local anesthetic infiltration is effective, but it's short lasting. Surgeons also don't tend to do the posterior bit of the knee very well because they quite rightly fierce, fear piercing the popliteal vessels and possibly the, uh, damaging the nerves or blocking the nerves as well. So they don't tend to do it quite as well. So the posterior bit is a bit of an issue. We know that static nerve block is effective, but at least a profound motor and sensory block and can even in some patients um, lead to pressure sores on the back of the heel if the, if the nursing care is, uh, is not aware of, um, of what's being done post-op. So this is a really nice paper from last year in anesthesia and analgesia that looked at adding uh, adductor canal blocks and um, IPAC blocks to local anesthetic infiltration. So this is kind of doing what I'm doing for all my knees now. So they blinded and randomized 86 patients into a control group who just got infiltration alone and an active group who got a modified infiltration plus IPAC plus what they called a ductus canal block. So here's our um, uh, infiltration group. They got a standard kind of mega cocktail that's done all around the world now. 200 milligrams of bupivacaine, adrenaline, Importantly, some steroid, and that's really, we're realizing this is very important. Steroid um, really improves post-op recovery in terms of extended analgesic effects um, and some other bits and pieces. So that was their infiltration. The active group got a bit less bupivacaine, but otherwise the same volume and the same other drugs as, as above. The adductor canal group got 15 mils and the IPAC group got 25 mils of 0.25 bupivacaine. Uh, the uh, ductus canal group got a little bit of dex as well, just to muddy the water slightly. And the IPAC group were going from medial to lateral. You can go from either side, as I'll show you in a second. They got a multimodal analgesic pathway, fairly standard, sort of similar-ish to what we're doing. Um, they also got um, a kind of protocolized opioid rescue um, in terms of analgesic failure for patients. What did they see? Well, they saw really quite impressive results. Less pain on ambulation, days 0, 1 and 2, significantly, of course. Less pain at rest, days 0 and 1. Less pain after physio, days 0 and 1. Less opioids in recovery and on day 0. Less side effects, concentration, dry mouth headache, day 0. Itchiness and vomiting, day 1. So not surprisingly, the patients noticed this and were more satisfied in the active group on all of the, the days of the study, days 0, 1 and 2. So the patients noticed that what they had was better. Are these pain scores clinically relevant? Well, these are them. Uh, these are the pain scores at rest. You can see sort of 3.5, 0.8, 3.4, 1.2 on days 0 and 1, so significantly less. And then we know that opioids are particularly bad at dynamic pain, and you can see that there. Really much better pain scores, clinically better pain scores in my view, um, on days 0 and 1. Um, so these blocks were really extending well into the first post-op day and giving patients a much better um, analgesic outcome. All of the other uh, opioid usages were lower in the, in the active group as you'd expect, so significantly lower in recovery and on day and up to 24 hours and significantly less rescue analgesia here and significantly less need for a PCA to rescue patients in the active group. So really, I think what this is telling us is that these blocks are a way of getting our patients out of bed more quickly and out of hospital more quickly. Let's just have a look at what's going on. Um, this is the, obviously the nurse supply to the knee. If you just look at the right-hand picture first, this is the posterior view of the knee. So here's the sciatic nerve dividing into the common perineal and the tibial branches. And you can see these articular branches are given off sort of somewhere just above the knee capsule um, and sort of down towards the knee capsule. 
Of interest, here's the posterior branch of the obturator nerve coursing around and supplying the posterior medial side of the knee joint. Now have a look over at the anterior view of the knee on the left, and this is really interesting. Here's the uh, nerve to vastus medialis that we blocked in our subsartorial block. Here's the saphenous nerve supplying some, um, some supply into the joint as well. So that's our anterior block. But also have a look at these. Here's the suprolateral genicular nerve from the saphenous nerve. Here's the infralateral genicular nerve from the common perineal. Here's the recurrent fibular nerve from the common perineal. Here's the supromedial genicular nerve from the sciatic nerve. And here's the infromedial genicular nerve from the tibial nerve. So really some quite important innovation of the knee coming from the back side of the knee. So I'm just putting this slide up just to show you that they have dissected out these articular branches in various cadaveric studies. And you can see that there's quite a lot of variation and variety. These are sort of you know, three different examples um, of, the, of the articular supply. Suffice to say, these nerves are traveling deep um, to the uh, sciatic nerve branches. You can sort of design a kind of heat map if you like. This is the back of the knee again, the medial side, the blue um, uh, branches of the posterior branch of the obturator nerve, the red branches of the articular fibers coming down from the sciatic um, and the uh, common fibular nerve on the lateral side. Um, and the green and purple are the tibial articular fibres. So we're going to put our IPAC block in around this level here to knock off these branches. So how do we do it? Again, I consent the patient for a block, tell them they may get a heavy leg again. I've not been aware of one yet. I like to get the, uh, the heel stabilised, the leg stabilised in a carter bane, just so the leg isn't wobbling around and your view is wobbling around on, on your ultrasound picture. Do take care to sort of really sterilise quite carefully this area. We're kind of getting near to where the surgeons are operating. I think it's quite important we take care to um, create a sterile field. We need a slightly longer needle for this block. We need a curvilinear probe. Now, not everyone will be used to using those all the time. That does add a sort of, sort of slightly sort of uh, increased level of difficulty to the block. But you do need that kind of wide view of what you're looking at to um, to get, a, to get a, a, a view right across the back of the knee. Um, you need to plan the insertion point of your needle, uh, as I'll show you in a second, using the depth on the scan screen. And I use 15, 20 mils of 0.25 LV Pivocaine. So again, this is a, a pre-scan picture. This is the back of the knee. This is the lateral side, curvilinear view here. Here's the lateral condyle of the femur. And what you'll see now is me just sort of scanning around. I can see the uh, tibial nerve here, the common perineal nerve moving towards and away from each other. This is the biceps femoris muscle on the left, popliteal artery pulsating nicely. Now, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to, in the block in the next slide, move my, my probe slightly proximally to get this condyle out of the way. I want lots of room to get my needle down to the midpoint of the knee joint here. So here I've inserted my needle and what I've done is I've counted one, two, three, four centimetres. So I've inserted my needle four centimetres away from my probe. So I get a nice sort of flat trajectory of my needle. And what you can see here is a really nice little expansion here. And this should feel really easy, almost no resistance at all. If you get resistance in my uh, experience that the block doesn't work. You need to get this sort of almost sort of fatty area here just behind the knee joint filled up with local anaesthetic and you can do it how you like. If you see the spread right across the back of the femur here then you've done the business that's fine but you might need to put a bit sort of um, a bit laterally and a bit medially just to get that nice spread. This is a video that um, the, uh, the authors of the, the paper I showed you um, uh, made. So they go from medial side, you can go from medial lateral, it doesn't matter. Uh, they're making the point that they go above the condyle just like I did, um, just so you've got the condyle out of the way and you've got an easy access to the back of the knee. And again, here we go, they're going sort of, you know, that four centimetres away from their probe to get that nice flat trajectory across the screen. This is the medial side this time, I come from this side. But there's the uh, popliteal artery, there are the branches of the sciatic nerve. And they're doing exactly the same thing. They're just looking for this spread across the back of the femur 
to catch all these articular branches that are coursing into the back of the knee. OK, we're nearly done. So in summary, um, femoral triangle, adductor canal, if you want to call it that, or I think subsartorial is the best way to think about it, because with ultrasound, that's what we're looking for primarily is the, is the sartorius muscle and the femoral artery. That's the easy landmark to find this block. It's, effect, it's an effective motor sparing block for knee surgery. It should have a low complication rate. Certainly, you're not going to damage the femoral nerve proper because you're not blocking the femoral nerve proper. And it's better than infiltration alone. The analgesia is lasting into at least the first post-op day. And certainly, the surgeons I've, who actually take an interest, and I've talked to about this, are saying that they think the patients look better on the first post-op morning um, after the, they've had these blocks. The adductor canal, more distal blocks, is affected to block the saphenous nerve, so it's good for ankle surgery. And there may be a possible spread into the popliteal fossa, so watch this space. The Danish group are doing research into that. That's uh, Jens Borglum um, and Thomas Benson. The IPAC block is, again, an effective motor sparing block for knee surgery. Anatomically, it should be effective. It's got branches that are going around to the anterior side of the knee as well. So I think it's a really good addition uh, for, um, for knee arthroplasty. It's uh, going to have a low complication rate because you're not actually blocking the sciatic nerve properly, you know, formal sciatic nerve. Um, but do watch uh, that you don't damage, the, obviously, the popliteal vessels or you go too, uh, too superficially uh, and, and actually uh, block the sciatic nerve proper. It's a bit more tricky to place. It requires a curved probe. It's a deeper block, so it takes a bit more getting used to. Okay, so in the last couple of minutes, I'm just going to briefly mention the mo this motor sparing block of the hip. So Philip Philip Peng obviously wanted to name a block after himself, did this study a couple of years ago, looking at uh, the articular supply and developing that articular supply into a block for the hip. So on the left here, you've got the pelvis, here's the anterior superior iliac spine, anterior inferior iliac spine, corresponding to here and here. Iliopubic eminence here. And what he uh, uh, derived from the cadaveric studies was that the articular branch from the femoral nerve here comes off really quite high and runs between the anterior inferior iliac spine and the iliopubic eminence to flow into the hip joint. This is traced here. And it runs deep to the psoas muscle, importantly. If you look to the right, this is the accessory obturator nerve, which exists just medial to the femoral nerve and supplies quite an important uh, sensory contribution into the hip. And it exists in quite a substantial number of people. The other anterior supply is the obturator nerve. Looking to the left, you can just see the obturator nerve emerging from the obturator frame in here. And that also supplies some anterior supply into the hip. So he did a cadaveric study, and you've always got to take these methylene blue studies with a pinch of salt. But he put his methylene blue underneath psoas muscle, which is here, this iliopsoas, femoral nerve. He showed sparing of the femoral nerve from the blue, the blue dye, and he showed really good staining of these articular branches with his methylene blue. And with his lower 10 mil um, block, he got this spread on the right here, or on the left of the patient cadaver, if you like. Um, so 10 mils covered the uh, femoral nerve articular supply and the accessory obturator nerve, but not the obturator nerve itself. And he felt that his 20 mil injection was actually creeping around to catch also the obturator nerve um, at a supply into the hip as well. So he felt that a, a higher volume block would be the way to go for this. Really easy block to place, actually. Easy ultrasound to find. You uh, place your block like so, and what you're trying to do is identify the anterior superior spine, drop inferiorly onto the next sort of bony prominence, which is the anterior inferior iliac spine, oblique sort of uh, positioning of your probe over the iliopubic eminence. And that gives you this picture, which is kind of like your femoral nerve block picture, but a bit lower down. This is the anterior inferior iliac spine running down to the iliopubic eminence. So you've got your nice bony sort of landmark there. Femoral artery, this is pectineus muscle, and this is psoas tendon. And that is your target for your block because your needle needs to go underneath psoas tendon, away from the nerve structures, 
um, underneath psoas tendon. And what you're trying to do is get your needle to lift psoas tendon and flow local up onto the iliopubic eminence, kind of like that. That's a local anaesthetic after injection. And what he did, he did a case series on five fractured neck ephemers, showed that he abolished their rest pain. This is the orange is the post block um, rest pain. So he abolished it in most of his patients. And his dynamic pain was much improved after half an hour in most of his patients. There hasn't really been uh, any great studies on this so far. This is one study that I managed to just see the results of, very recent from Canadian Journal. I haven't seen the whole paper, um, but a fairly modest result, I must say, in hip arthroplasty, um, 10 to 20 morphine equivalent reduction in the first 24 hours. The problem is with hip replacement is these patients get out of bed pretty quickly anyway. Pain isn't really as much of a problem as it is with knee surgery. Um, so, you know, probably not surprising that this is a fairly modest result with the pain block. I think the trouble with a pain block for me is one of the mechanisms I think that our femoral nerve blocks and our fascia alka blocks give us very rapid onset analgesia in the anaesthetic room for fractured neck of femurs is that we get vastus muscle relaxation. So we relax the muscles in the thigh and detension the neck of femur fracture and that allows us to sit our patients forward. And I think we might not get that quite so profoundly with the pain block. But all this remains to be seen. They've not really done the evidence yet. Uh, they've not really produced the evidence yet for the, the, the efficacy of this block. However, it's got potential to be a motor sparing block of the anterior hip nerve supply, the accessory obturator nerve and the femoral nerve. So lack of motor block in hip fracture would be the, the reason to do a pain block but little evidence so far. So watch this space. There are some encouraging early case reports, um, but we'll, uh, we'll, we'll wait for the proper studies on that. That is all I've got to say. I hope that was of some use to you.